The GCC has long dominated the global hydrocarbon market and continues to play a critical role in shaping the direction of the industry. With its vast oil and gas reserves, the GCC remains well-placed to power both the upstream and downstream sector and set the agenda for a greater push towards cleaner energy adoption locally, regionally and globally. The story of oil in the Middle East is not a contemporary tale, but began a long time ago. The first oil discovery in the region was in 1931 at an oil well in the remote Jebel Dukan area of Bahrain. Soon, one by one, each of the other GCC countries made their own discoveries, paving the way towards a radical transformation across the region. And then, in 2016, a new regional initiative was undertaken to further strengthen the association of these countries, and Bahrain was chosen as its headquarters due to the Kingdom's strategic location. The Gulf Downstream Association, or GDA, was founded by Saudi Aramco, Bahrain Petroleum Company, Kuwait Petroleum International, Kuwait National Petroleum Company, and Abu Dhabi National Oil Company as a non-profit organization that will serve as a catalyst for strong and sustainable growth of the downstream industry and provide a viable platform for knowledge sharing and best practice. The idea of GDA started a few years back mainly to promote the cooperation and the coordination between the oil industries in the downstream field to ensure that we have a vehicle within the GCC to share practices, share lesson learned. The Gulf Downstream Association, it brings a lot of experience of industry. We are focusing into bringing these experience together and putting these companies into the prospective and its real position in the oil and gas industry. GDA's formation provides the springboard for effective partnerships across the region that will build on the strengths of each member organization in preparing a world-class workforce that can meet the challenges of tomorrow and most crucially, help in creating a voice for the region on international platforms by being innovative, by creating a knowledge hub and serving as a reference point for all stakeholders. Our approach is very simple. If I have an area of excellence that I've excelled in, then it only makes sense that among the different companies within the GCC that we will be able to share and all of us excelling at the same time. The key to GDA's long-term success will be the values that guide its operations, as well as the main propositions that drive its appeal. Near to 018, we're looking to develop other conferences uh, that will add value to our founding companies and members. Members have access to a rich repository of valuable information through GDA's very own portal. Possibility to attend or opportunity to conduct industry-related technical or leadership events. Share knowledge and experience and adopt best practice to pave the way for greater sustainability that includes tapping the invaluable expertise of the senior transitional workforce. Enhance communication between members to help foster good relations with global industries and associations. Provide a voice for members to strengthen the three pillars of strategy, industry, government and education. GDA will provide for us an excellent forum to achieve operational excellence in our respective companies in areas like maintenance efficiency, personal efficiency, energy efficiency, as well as capital efficiency and project execution. The GDA is starting with the Arabian Gulf, of course, but we are also starting big and we're already interacting with all the multinationals. And the technologists are really uh, going to be an important part of uh, our membership portfolio, uh, the EPC as well. And this is where we feel our strength is, by getting the stakeholders together, networking, identifying the business and technical challenges. GDA is poised to be the perfect platform for future generations in the GCC. For the youth in the oil, gas and refining sector, it will prepare them for tomorrow's challenges, as well as help them manage the daily hectic demands of this innovative and rewarding industry. The choice is now in our hands. 
Opportunities are all around us, and together with the GDA, we can create a stronger and more sustainable downstream industry. GDA. Share and excel. Welcome to GDA Conversations. My name is Raj Hajaria, Technical Manager with Gulf Downstream Association. Gulf Downstream Association is a non-profit association founded by Saudi Aramco, Adnoc, Babco, KNPC, and KPI. The main objective of Gulf Downstream Association is to create a platform on which all the players of the downstream industry can share their knowledge and experiences. GDA Conversation is a series in which we talk to the industry leaders and subject matter experts. My guest today doesn't need any introduction. He is John Pesci, president of Stratas Advisors, who are the leaders in the market research of our industry both upstream and downstream. We are also joined today by our Secretary General, Mr. Oda Al Ahmadi, and some subject matter experts from our Industry Trend Committee and Project Management Technical Committees. For the Q&A after the session presentation with John. So without further ado, let me introduce and welcome, Mr. John Pesci. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, share some of our views on what we see in the uh, from the impact from COVID-19 and the aftermath that we see uh, as, as the world starts to recover from the uh, COVID-19. So today I have some slides I'd like to share with you and then uh, answer any questions afterwards. So first of all, Obviously, COVID-19 has had a big impact on the global economy. And we expect, and we're seeing that, that there's a, a, a sharp decline in economic activity in Q2. Uh, we see that uh, having the impact of more than 10% globally in terms of the, the, the downturn in the economy. And the U.S. decline, we see a, a, a down by 18%. Now, we expect that will remain negative in comparison to 2019, meaning the economy in terms of absolute size will be smaller than it was in 2019 throughout the remainder of the year. But we also see that the decline is not as deep as what some of the forecasts have been. Uh, there were some very, very uh, sharp uh, uh, declines that have been forecasted coming out of the U.S., but we're starting to see the U.S. economy and other parts of the global economy start to return faster than expected. But in general, we see the U.S. will have a sharper and deeper decline than the rest of OECD-type countries, and then we'll recover more quickly. Part of that is structural and the way the U.S. handles employment, where there is a, a, was a fairly major decline in employment, but then as the economy starts to move forward, the, those jobs start to return. When we look outside of the OECD developed countries, we, in, in terms of emerging and developing markets, we see those are also negatively affected, but not to the same extent of OECD countries, in part because these countries did not have the wherewithal to stop their economies and have uh, people shelter at home near as much as it was in some of the Western type economies. So we see obviously there's gonna be a big decline in Q2 of this year, and then the economy is starting to open back up. The question is going to be is, will there be a rebound uh, in the impact of COVID-19 as the weather returns to, in Q3, Q4 of the year up in the northern part of the world to colder, colder weather? Uh, at this point, we, we think that rebound will be muted, and we expect the economies will, will 
be less affected in Q3 and Q4 than they were in uh, Q1 and Q2 of this year. When we look at, obviously, when you look at the, that impact that we had on the global economy, there also was a big impact on oil demand. And we see that in the comparison to 2019, that Q2 demand will be down around 13 million barrels per day. And when, uh, when you look at all of 2020, we see demand being down about 8.5 uh, million barrels per day, less than in 2019. A lot of that comes from gasoline, uh, especially in uh, North America and Europe where uh, the, there was shelter at home and there was a, a large significant drop in, in miles and kilometers being driven. Uh, diesel dropped, but not near to the uh, same level as gasoline, in part because uh, diesel is uh, still uh, less discretionary uh, miles uh, associated with the use of diesel, and you still had lots of freight and shipments moving on, in, even though the economy had dropped in terms of overall activity. Jet fuel had the biggest impact, obviously, because planes just stopped flying, around less than 80% drop in, in number of flights and so forth. So there was a major impact on, on, the, on the gasoline demand, uh, jet fuel demand. When you look at where the impact was in terms of light duty, both gasoline and diesel, a big impact came from in, in both in absolute barrels, but also in percentage-wise came from North America then uh, uh, Europe, and then Asia was followed up with that to about to the same extent. But a good part of this demand destruction took place in North America. And, um, and we see that part of that is because of the major drop in gasoline demand. When we look at oil supply, OPEC plus deal that was announced in April had a big impact on helping to stabilize oil prices. Oil prices had dropped down to around $20 a barrel. Uh, but when this deal came through, uh, that helped stabilize the market. And then we're starting the return with the economy starting to open back up, you're starting to see prices stabilize and starting to move upwards. So, and then uh, recently, very recently, this weekend, OPEC announced that these cuts will be ex of 9.7 million barrels per day will be extended through July. And that, the, but the additional cut of 1 million by Saudi Arabia will end this month at the end of June. So these cuts will, at this level, will last through July, and then they'll go to uh, lower cuts of 7.7 .7 million barrels per day, and then uh, uh, and then cuts of, um, of those as we go into next year will drop to 5.7. But we, uh, we expect that there'll be good compliance with these cuts and that OPEC plus will, uh, given where we are in terms of prices and the demand outlook, will have uh, high compliance with these types of cuts. Another big impact on why prices have started to stabilize is really how fast the U.S. production has dropped. And it's dropped a lot faster than what we saw back in, 20, uh, in the aftermath of the 2014 price decline. So if you look at the gray line, which is U.S. production, it has dropped to more than 13 million barrels down to 11 and a half million barrels. In, in a very short period of time, in a matter of weeks. This is a very sharp decline. As I said, back in, uh, in the aftermath of 2014 price decline, it took a year for this type of declines to, to uh, take place. So we've seen very sharp declines and we expect these declines to continue through uh, 2021. And at the end of the day, US production to be around 3 million barrels less than it was at its peak. And we believe even with the prices starting to stabilize some, that U.S. production will continue to decline because of the issues uh, of uh, balance sheets of many of the uh, companies that are involved in shale, uh, less access to debt, and therefore they will need to reduce the drilling uh, programs that they had in place before the uh, COVID-19. When we look at oil prices, we see that uh, there's going to be a longer overhang on oil prices, in part because inventories we expect will continue to build, 
even with these production cuts. And then they'll only start to decline as we move into the second half of 2021. So it's going to take some time to rebound the market. Uh, there's also going to be uh, this uh, uh, overhang in terms of excess capacity. So we expect that, that oil prices will continue to struggle in terms of Brent prices and stay above 40 barrels uh, per uh, uh, $40 per barrel until you really start to get into May of 2021. And then after that, it, it, with the return in demand, the impact of the production cuts, you'll start to see prices gradually move upwards. Okay, now what does this mean for refiners? When we look at it from a short-term impact, obviously refining profitability and margins will be dampened by the need to operate at reduced utilization rates. When you have this type of decline in demand, you're going to have to pull back on per, uh, uh, utilization rate at refineries. Also with these production cuts, you've seen that crude prices have ramped up faster and stabilized and starting to move upwards. Uh, it faster than what we've seen in the terms of what uh, the recovery in demand, because we've had fairly steep declines in production. And that also puts further pressure on refining margins. We think gasoline demand will bounce back from very low levels. And we're starting to see that as, as uh, activity picks up in the U.S. and uh, other major gasoline uh, demand markets. As, as the economy picks up, as workers start to go back to work, commuting increases and so forth. But they'll remain below the trend level uh, before uh, COVID-19. There is going to be some impact of uh, people learning to uh, work from home as they have over the last few months means that uh, there will be less commuting. Uh, but that will be more on the margin, but it's still just going to take time for uh, economic activity to pick up. So from a short-term impact, when we look at it from a refining perspective, we expect that refining profitability will obviously be dampened by the need to operate at reduced utilization rates. With this decline in demand, and the time it will take for demand to uh, come back to more normal levels, refineries will have to operate at a lower utilization rate. The other impact uh, on refining margins in a negative way is that the production cuts we've seen both in OPEC and also in North America have uh, put a floor under crude prices and we've seen crude prices starting to recover. And that recovery in crude prices has happened faster than what we've seen in recovery in economic activity and demand. Therefore, you're seeing a squeezing of margins. When we look at individual products, you see gasoline demand, we expect will bounce back and do so fairly rapidly, but from a very low level and we expect the gasoline demand to remain below the trend level that we were seeing before COVID-19. In part because of some change in behavior, we're going to see less commuting, uh, we're going to see less discretionary miles, but uh, the, the, that impact will be more on the margin and we don't think they have as significant impact as maybe some people are thinking right now. We do see people will get back to going to work, going to their offices, and having the uh, engagement with their colleagues and also with their uh, uh, clients and, and uh, uh, business partners. Jet fuel, though, will lag. We're going to expect to see a, a slower rebound in air travel, less flights, less people flying, less business travel, and uh, also less uh, leisure travel in part because of the overhang of the economy and people having less money to spend or being feel less secure in spending money for travel that is is for leisure and not required. Uh, diesel demand as we pointed out earlier while not as affected by COVID-19 still will be negatively affected by just weaker economic growth. There is a correlation between diesel demand and economic growth and we're expecting lower economic growth in in comparison in terms of overall, overall economic activity than what we were seeing before the COVID-19. 
There's also this increased trade friction that we're seeing between the U.S. and China, which also is going to have some impact on freight movements and, and export and imports uh, 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 between those two countries, which are, uh, and that, that will also have some negative impact on diesel demand. When we look at further out and we start to see what is going to be the impact as after the world recovers, what are we starting to see? Well, we think crude prices will be more moderate levels than, than, uh, than what we might have expected before, just because it's going to be uh, a lower demand because you've, you've had this big drop in demand and it's going to take a while to come back up in, and in comparison to supply, you have, uh, a lot of excess capacity in terms of supply, both coming from OPEC, who's had to cut to help balance the, the supply demand uh, equation, but also in the US where now you have uh, pulled back, reduced drilling, a lot of potential though to re uh, start those programs and drill again as oil prices start to creep up. So you'll start to get, as, as prices move up, you'll start to see more activity and that helping to bring more barrels on, it'd be harder to stick to the OPEC plus agreed cuts. Then you also have other countries such as Canada and, uh, and other areas where, where the produ uh, production and supply has decreased. They'll also be looking to bring that supply on. So because of that potential to add supply and the, the time it will take to get through the overhang of, of COVID-19, we expect oil prices to be more moderate than what we would have seen before this uh, virus uh, and the impact of that virus took place. We also think light heavy differentials will be more uh, narrow uh, because of the reduced supply of heavy cr heavier crudes, partially because they were pulled off the market, also uh, in both in terms of some of the barrels pulled off from OPEC, but also Canadian production has dropped significantly. The ongoing issues in Venezuela uh, and, and Mexico will also have an impact. So we expect that light heavy differentials will not be as wide. Also, there was an investment that was being made in conversion capacity. So together, you have this situation, which will cause, uh, we think, uh, light heavies not, not, not be as wide as we would have otherwise. Um, we also see, as we go out further, demand growth will be less than in the past because of these structural changes. So these have not gone away. There's going to be the penetration of electric vehicles. There's alternative fuels that will be brought on, both in terms of renewable biodiesel, uh, uh, even uh, when you look at some of the other non-traditional fuels. Even you're starting to see hydrogen possibly uh, expanding over time. Now, there will be... Um, could be a slowdown in some of the drive towards a greener world as it's more difficult for countries to uh, invest in, the, in those type of uh, mandates and requirements, uh, given the, that they'll be have a weaker uh, fiscal situation, given the uh, recession that's come about because of COVID-19. Um, and also even from a monetary standpoint where many of the countries have had uh, uh, really have uh, in a sense uh, uh, backed up loans uh, and expanded the balance sheet of their, uh, of their central banks. So those, those will have some moderating impact, but the world still don't wanna be moving towards cleaner fuels, which means there'll be required investments by refiners and these investments really are a great opportunity for additional profits, but they're really a cost of doing business. And that's not going to change. They're going to be a little cleaner fuels, uh, uh, higher quality fuels in terms of octane and so forth. And that drive will continue. Uh, we see the opportunities for product exports will be less available and more competitive. Um, when you bring down the demand picture, uh, and it, 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 it's, there's going to be this less overall demand than before, which means it's going to be a more competitive world and um, think that it's be less attractive for those re, uh, uh, who are very reliant on exports. And we also obviously think there'll be increased pressure on refineries that have weak structural attributes, those who are uh, lacking scale, those with limited complexity, and those who've had poor logistics, either in terms of getting crude supply and or in terms of uh, uh, 
access to demand markets. Those type of refineries will be under increasing pressure and there may be a need to rationalize. We see that in certain markets. Uh, Europe uh, is one market where there's a, a could be some further rationalization, but there's also markets out in, in Asia where so the refineries are not very complex, small in scale and, and so forth and could be under pressure. Now, when we see what are the keys to success for uh, refiners, there's really, we see one given the uncertainty, uh, the uh, volatility, because uh, it's not going to be a straight line coming out of out of this uh, the aftermath of COVID nineteen. We we uh, think it's very important that refiners have a ver flexibility both from a strategic perspective, but also from an operational perspective. So really having this flexibility across the time horizons uh, is, is going to be very important. And to, to uh, be able to be proactive in making adjustments. And hand in hand goes with that is market knowledge. So this uh, uh, ability to assess what's going on in the short term and the longer term and being able to uh, prepare for those changes in the market are very important. Those go hand in hand. Then, of course, uh, reliable operations is always important. High reliability, efficiently run operations are going to be very, uh, very important and they're and, uh, even more important as, as we're in difficult times. And then the last one is really consideration of the whole supply chain. And this um, means all the way from sourcing feedstock, managing inventories, and then the supply of product to the market in making uh, in terms of where you can compete if you're an export refinery can you really uh, uh, have the supply chain set up for those export markets uh, in terms and uh, also being set with the right type of product and the right volumes of product and and uh, to match what is out there in terms of available markets to understand who you're competing with against in those markets uh, are all important. So we think these four elements really make up what it will be successful for a refiner. Um, and of course, it also depends on the specific attributes of the portfolio refineries, uh, the individual refineries in terms of, uh, of uh, the, their uh, uh, attributes. And then also what is the, how refining fits into the overall portfolio of a company in terms of upstream, uh, uh, midstream and and downstream, and and the, together those all those factors come together to come up with the right approach to operating both in the short term and then from a more strategic perspective as you look out longer term. So those are my uh, uh, slides I prepared for today, and I appreciate again the opportunity to present those uh, are some of our views, and uh, I'd be glad to take any questions you might have today. Thank you, John, for your insight. Uh, I'm sure our participants have uh, taken uh, good notice of your suggestions and ideas. And before I open the floor for the question and answer, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, we have seen uh, how OPEC plus agreement uh, withstanding right now and uh, going forward unto the end of July with deep penetration, deep cut, um, is helping the market. Uh, in your crystal ball viewing, uh, I want you to tell us how long do you think uh, it will take for the market to rebound in terms of demand as well as the price? Do you think it will happen 2020 or 2021 or may take even beyond 2021? Do you have any thought on that? considering all the factors, and obviously there are so much uncertainties involved, including the COVID-19 second wave, and how the market uh, will open up, economies will open up. Yes, we have, we have uh, views on that. We also have, a, uh, have to, of course, take a view on what we see the, uh, uh, 
the impact of COVID-19 in terms of will there be a second wave? Is there, se and how big will that second wave be? We have, uh, think there will be some uptick in COVID-19 cases in as the weather turns cold again up in the north, uh, but will not have near the impact that it had in the, in the uh, uh, March, April timeframe of, of the, this year. Uh, we don't expect a close down of the economies again. Uh, we, uh, in part because the many of the uh, countries are going to be in much better shape in terms of preparation, in terms of, of, uh, of protective equipment, in terms of uh, uh, having the hospitals ready. Also, we, we expect there will be some drugs that will help moderate the impact of, of those who get the virus. And also, the, as we get further out, there's going to be a, ch a greater chance of having some sort of vaccine. So we expect there will be some uptick, but it will not be anywhere near what we saw earlier uh, this year. In terms of where we see demand and, and, and supply and the rebalancing of the market, we really don't think that will happen until we get into May of next year. Uh, that it will take time for uh, demand to pick back up. It will take time for uh, uh, supply to rebalance with demand. And once that happens in May, then we'll start to see more favorable prices in, in uh, Q2, Q3 of next year, which will be closer to the more uh, the $60 type range on Brent, which will be more sustainable. Now that is, uh, that is our reference case. Of course, there's a lot of risk to that. There's the risk that uh, obviously from the demand side that the, the, the rebound in COVID is much greater and the economies struggle much more to reopen back up. Uh, and some of those jobs will not come back regardless as fast as, uh, as, as, uh, as, as they went away. Because there's going to be businesses that will be suffering. They don't, will not be able to bring uh, back employ, uh, their employees, employees. They won't be able to reopen. So there is definitely going to be an ongoing shakeup to the global economy. Uh, and it's not going to be a straight line. So we do expect, as I said before, trend growth will be lower and it will take a, 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 a several years to get back to regain all that lost demand. Also on the supply side, there's a lot of risk too, because in the past there's been, as soon as prices start to pick up, you start to see activity in the oil patch pick up in North America, for example. Uh, and uh, and then they start in th three to six months, production is starting to pick back up. And we think that's less likely to happen this time, though it's always a risk because, but we think it's less likely because we think it's more difficult for the shale type companies to spend significant amounts of capital because many of them have very weak balance sheets and also the access to debt is not as great as it used to be. So we expect there'll be some uh, additional discipline on the shale. Uh, and then when we look into OPEC plus, there's also risk because it's a much bigger deal than what we've seen in the past, uh, where, it's, where it's not just OPEC, it's other countries have to be involved, including Russia. And there'll also be some concern that as prices pick up, there'll be the uh, 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 further pressure to to uh, reduce those 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 cuts, but in general we think uh, OPEC plus uh, deal will has a good chance of holding for a while because prices are still too low for uh, at this point for for any uh, any of the producers to really be happy, uh, and and so we think that will this from the lower prices and the time it will take for those prices to recover, there'll be the, the, the uh, fairly good compliance with the OPEC plus cuts. But, but we do think it's going to take time. We, as I said, we don't think it's going to be to really queue uh, until May of next year that we start to see this more rebalance. So May 21 is probably your uh, forecast and uh, let's hope that it happens before that. Can I, uh... Ask Jan. Please go ahead, Abu Tarek. Yeah. Okay, Jan, thank you very much for uh, accepting to participate with us in this uh, 
conversation and thank you for a valuable uh, information and uh, thoughts. Uh, my question is, what you presented to us, is it on the optimistic side or on the opt uh, pessimistic side? And uh, with, you know, uh, with the opening of China, uh, market and economy, which is a major uh, consumer, and, as, uh, and also uh, the United States also is opening up. Don't you think this will uh, speed up uh, the recovery and make things probably closer uh, or better, uh, you know, it will make the demand much better than uh, with, uh, or closer to the supply? I, in terms of as our forecast, optimistic or pessimistic, I like to think that we, we've taken a balanced, realistic a, a view, uh, which is really driven by our, our uh, analysis and what we're seeing in the marketplace and what comes out of our uh, quantitative models. So, uh, so we think we have a well-balanced forecast now, in terms, is there some upside there could be? Yes, I would say that China has opened up. We're seeing a much more normal activity there. Uh, U.S. had a very favorable jobs report, which is a, uh, last week, which is a sign that the U.S. economy is picking up in some ways faster than some had thought and that, and that the decline wasn't quite as deep. Uh, but uh, when I, uh, the when we look at the, for example, the U.S., there's still a lot of hurdles to get through before we're back to normal activity. Uh, we have issues with um, companies that are in a much weakened position. Uh, there's going to be further shakeout in terms of those companies. Uh, there's a shift in the economy in terms of how some of the old traditional companies have been damaged. And, uh, and some of those will never come back the way they were. So, so when you have these shifts, there is, there's also some, uh, uh, some uh, dis, uh, also has an impact on growth. Um, and then uh, when you look at China, they're going to be hindered some by, we think this increased trade friction that we're seeing between the U.S. and China, but there's also issues now with other parts of uh, other countries. Uh, so this increased friction in the global economy also dampens overall economic growth. Uh, so I, I, it's uh, there. There are uh, upside. There also is ri uh, risk that things could be better, but there's also these downside risk. But um, that, that are going to cause some problems. Um, uh, but but I, from a favorable standpoint, if you look at uh, Europe in the US and, and, and the other OECD countries, they are throwing a lot of money at the situation. They, their, their central banks have acted very uh, aggressively. Uh, there's been uh, fiscal programs. Uh, but for example, in the US, that's only run out probably in about two months. So will there be another deal? There could likely there'll be some sort of deal because neither party in the U.S. <laughs> is going to want to go into the election uh, um, uh, with, with being seen as not supporting the economy. So, uh, but so there there's upsides and uh, potential and downside potential. So we think we've taken a very balanced approach. And, and it's not just going to be a, a sharp V recovery right back to where we were before. There's just too much, I think, too many hurdles to come through, too many potholes and uncertainties out there. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, Avatarik, thank you very much for your question. Uh, may I ask uh, any of our other subject matter experts? We have with us Gurminder Singh from Shell. Yeah, I have a question, uh, yeah, uh, John, uh, for you. So the question is, uh, you mentioned in the short term uh, trends that perhaps there will be some recovery on in the gasoline. Uh, 
and because as uh, also in the aviation or jet fuel as the travel starts what would be your views because what how i think and perhaps you can uh, tell that whether that is aligned with what strata's th thinking is or your analysis is people will still not be traveling in the next say 12 to 18 months so much i would say to pre covid days so the demand for jet and kero will be low but if people are not traveling by airplanes and the market is really opening up particularly the us market people will be driving more so when people are driving more there will be a significant increase in gasoline demand whereas in your view or in strata's view the, in the shorter term you're saying that there will not be a significant change or increase in the gasoline demand so how would you think uh I would say we're expecting, when you look at this level, we expect gasoline demand to increase significantly over time, but we're, we're, we expect that gasoline demand to take a while to get back up to where we were before the crisis, and we expect it, uh, demand growth afterwards to be, uh, uh, for a while, more moderate. Uh, in terms of the shift, because people, uh, if people aren't flying while they drive, uh, I suppose when you look at it, yes, there, there could be on the margin some additional, when you look at the, the summer season in the U.S., you'll have uh, probably more people, uh, uh, you'll have some of the people who are taking vacations will drive more, maybe that would have flown in the, in the past. Um, but when you look at overall miles driven, we don't think they'll be higher than they were before the crisis. We expect them to be lower partially because there's still going to be a number of people unemployed in the U.S., which is going to dampen. Uh, uh, people are going to be less likely to spend money that they do not have to have. And many miles in the U.S. are, uh, are uh, discretionary miles. Uh, so we do still expect that to be dampened some. Also, when you look at miles uh, spent on commuting, we expect there'll be less commuting than there was before because when we looked at the economy, uh, uh, for example, in the US, and these are fairly rough numbers, 40% of the workforce could work from home. 40% um, uh, uh, was uh, what would be called essential workers, and then 20% were those that were uh, had to be on the job, but not necessarily essential. So that would have been your restaurant, uh, people work in restaurants and so forth. So this 40% have, over these last few months, have gotten used to working from home, right? So now that doesn't mean they're never coming back to the office, but you're, I think you're going to see more people maybe three days in the office, two days at home, or four days at the office, one day home. And that's going to have some dampening impact uh, on, on, on miles driven in the U.S. And, and so I, I do not expect that you're going to have, because there's less flying, you're going to have this great uptick in, 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 uh, in on-road traffic. In part, one, leisure travel, there'll be less of it. Uh, and it won't have a big enough impact. When you look at travel that is associated with uh, business travel, I think you're just starting to see less business travel for a while. There would be more than there is now, but I think people are still going to put off tri uh, trips. They've gotten used to doing these type of meetings, and I just think there's going to be uh, less uh, business travel as, as a whole for a while. Uh, so, John, uh, yeah, related question to this. So, what? How will the refineries really adjust their uh, jet or kero make? Means one thing is that they can indeed uh, change the cut points, but still, um, for the last three months, means flying is uh, almost nil, and it will recover very slowly. So, with all the inventories what are built in, can refineries really go to say minimal to zero production of jet and fuel with the current inventories? Uh, well, no, I don't. I don't think that's possible. But they are going to have to make the adjustments as much as they can to reduce production of jet fuel, both in terms, as you mentioned, the way they operate the refineries, but also in the utilization rates. They're just going to have to pr uh, produce less volume of product in whole. So, 
what this is going to do is put pressure on, on, on refineries to run at reduced rates. Uh, it also will cause some of the marginal refineries uh, to have to, uh, at some point, uh, start to ra uh, close down, rationalize. So this will be the impact. There, there's, uh, there's a, a limit to what can be done in terms of generating demand for jet fuel in this situation. Um, uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, freight movements will probably pick up. So freight by air did not drop as much. So we'll see that uh, increase some. But I think it's going to take a while for the leisure, uh, for the commercial jets, uh, for, for business and leisure travel to pick up. And it, it, it's, it is increasing, but it's increasing at a fairly low rate at this point, at least when you're looking in certain parts of the, uh, of the world. Now, uh, in other parts, for example, in China, the, their, their demand could pick up some, but it's relatively small when you look at the U.S. and you look at Europe, uh, 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 jet travel or uh, air travel. So that that's it's going to take some time for that to come back and 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 uh, uh, and, and it's very difficult to encourage that it, it, the, 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 there's only so much that can be done for the airlines can encourage the travel um, uh, uh, and and uh, so we're going to see still some uh, reduced amount of jet uh, and commercial uh, air travel. Okay, thank you. Um, Michal, uh, we have Michal, our subject matter experts and deputy chairperson from project management technical committee from KNPC. Actually, I don't have questions already. Uh, Mr. Abu Tariq, uh, more or less, he asked uh, the similar one. Uh, Mr. al -Oda, thank you. And uh, I would like uh, uh, to thank uh, Mr. John for the valuable information. And they have no uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Michal. Uh, now, for uh, John, for the shale uh, production uh, USA, uh, how soon it will come to its original production? I know a lot of uh, reduction in the uh, drilling, uh, drilling and uh, uh, wells. Now, how soon it will come back? again to its original uh, uh, production? Well, it, it, U.S. production reached around 13 million, or a little over 13 million earlier this year, and then it's now yeah. dropped down uh, to, to, uh, to less than 11 and a half, and we expect those declines to continue, and really to, to continue through, uh, through uh, the rest of this year and into next year. So in total, we expect those declines to be close to 3 million barrels. So when you look at that in the time it will take to come back, we don't see shale uh, U.S. production hitting that level again for uh, until when you start to look at 2023, 2024, it's going to take a while for that to come back, even if you have fairly aggressive supply coming back up. So it, 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 and, uh, so it's going to take some time because uh, if you look at once you're, uh, you know, the, 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 they switch to trying to increase production. You're seeing we would expect production increases more into the uh, one to one and a half million barrels per year type range at that point. Uh, so it will take some time. That would only change if we start to see very uh, strong crude prices again. But what we're expecting is uh, that as prices increase, to, uh, uh, and you start to get back to the $60, $65 level, you'll start to see the OPEC plus cuts starting to uh, re be reduced. And uh, that will moderate prices. And then you're, you're going to see, um, so, so that it would only leave a certain window for shale to come back into at that point. Uh, now, th th there is a possibility that that they uh, they're, they're able to raise the financing and they really start drilling very hard again. But uh, I don't know how many times we can go through this cycle before those who are providing that capital realize that there has to be some discipline on the shale in sector in the U.S. or you're just going to keep driving 
the uh, oil market back into these downturns over and over again. And this is what we saw uh, in uh, 2014 and then we saw again. And, uh, and uh, so we would expect that it will take some time to come back. And we're really looking out into the 2023 level uh, time frame before we start to see shale coming back to where it was before. On the renewable, now with the lower uh, crude prices, do you think uh, the renewable will be uh, taking more share than it was thought before? No, I, I don't think it will take more share, but, uh, and, and as I said, uh, there will be some stress on countries and uh, in uh, states and provinces to uh, subsidize and push uh, uh, as, as hard on, on, on alternative and uh, fuels uh, as they were in the past because uh, the, they don't won't have the um, not necessarily the wherewithal from a financial standpoint to, in, to to do so but we do not see the trend towards uh, cleaner, greener fuels going away. Uh, so what, for example, in the U.S., we're seeing still very strong support uh, for uh, re uh, renewable biofuels, same way in Europe. This is not going away, and now you're seeing refiners get involved in this because they've, uh, they're, uh, they're uh, making it integral to their, uh, uh, to their existing refining facilities. Uh, but those are fairly small volumes. And then when you look at... Uh, Ethanol, that's not going away because that's blend stock that's required to meet the, the give uh, gasoline uh, uh, help with the octane and, and so forth. Uh, so that's not going away. So uh, it, I, we don't expect to have more share, but it's certainly not going away because of these low oil prices. It's, it's just not. And, wh and what we're seeing also from the, the vehicle side, uh, Auto manufacturers are still moving forward with their electric vehicles. Um, that is a strategy that, uh, that, that I think they're committed to and they're not going away from that. So that will continue to, those will come into the market. Um, uh, but maybe uh, we, we were, uh, in terms of our forecast, we always had a more moderate view of how fast that penetration would be because, again, you can only subsidize so many vehicle purchases. But we do see that is the trend that we're starting to see that. That's where the auto uh, sector is going with. So we don't see that going away. Um, so it, 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 we don't see it greater, but we don't see it going away. And it's going to be a, a long-term trend in, in, in uh, that's going to affect the oil sector. What about hydrogen? Well, hydrogen, it seems to have, uh, yes, uh, uh, some interest that we're seeing in certain markets. Europe, of course, has some, but we're, we also see uh, in Asia, it's, uh, the, the, they also have uh, some interest. Uh, and in some ways, uh, thinking that is, uh, we'll get into the transport sector and has some uh, advantages in comparison to electric vehicles if you went to a hydrogen and to a fuel cell. But we think that the, on the, uh, the impact will come later on that. That will not happen for a while, even though we're starting to see some interest again in hydrogen. It's going to take, to have any material impact, it will take many years for that to have an impact on the oil sector. Thank you, Abu Tarek, for uh, extracting deeper insight from John on some of the issues which are all pertinent to our industry. And uh, John, uh, thank you once again and uh, all, all, all our predictions, all our crystal ball viewing is dependent on one critical factor, which is the vaccine. When the vaccine of COVID-19 be in the market and become mass available, that will probably uh, decide the future course of action and perhaps uh, our recovery also. So let's hope and pray that this happens fast and uh, we all get back to uh, some sense of progress as soon as possible. John, once again, thank you. And thank you again, Gurminder, Mishal, Abu Tarek, and uh, San, and my team, Ranjit. John, thank once you, again, Rod. thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, John, very much uh, for participating with us. And we hope 
it's, uh, we hope the betterness for the whole world. Uh, this uh, pandemic, pandemic will go away as soon so that we, uh, the economy will uh, go back to normal. Uh, we, uh, I second that and I hope to see everybody in person uh, sooner than later. Okay, have a nice day all, to all of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you once again.